professor uh, in the CS department at University of Victoria in Canada, and he's going to be talking about the challenges of licensing in Debian. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so as I was introduced, I'm actually a, a professor, and um, I started doing a little bit of um, free software when I was a grad student. I used to help in, in the non project. And, um, and then when I became a um, professor, some of my research, actu research actually moved into looking at the way that open source and free software is developed and, um, and what we can actually learn about it and then how we can actually help the developers who are doing it. Um, so let me give you a little bit of my credentials. So um, I submit patches here and there. and. Um, Two of the ones that have been working um, lately is um, Sofish, the window manager that I use, and uh, Sornal, which is actually the application that, that you see here. And, um, but I also maintain a library, and um, most people never actually know which libraries they use. And uh, the, the main application that uses it is, is Hugin, so I see Hugin as a big um, community of, of applications. It's intended to do um, panoramas, and uh, so I, one of my hobbies is photography, so I do also some work in that. Um, but in terms of my research, so in the last two years, we have been heavily involved with uh, issues relating to licensing, and uh, as they apply to um, free and open source uh, software. Um, it's, it has been a very interesting uh, two years because before us, nobody had really looked at the implications of licensing from a software engineering point of view. Um, it was the realm of, of the lawyers, and the lawyers argue about it. And the software developers, they dealt with it, but uh, from the point of view of us, the researchers, nobody really um, care about those, those kinds of issues. And in fact, it's still a little bit uh, interesting that some of my colleagues, they actually feel asked, uh, why should I care? Why is it important? And um, so it's, it's something that um, they're just waking up to. Uh, by the way, so um, almost all the, pap all the papers are available in, in my website. And if not, they'd email me because some of the copyright doesn't allow me to actually make them available. So, but I'll email them to you um, directly. So uh, one of the things, um, or at least from, from, um, from a sale point, um, I strongly believe that, that, that free and open source software has fulfilled the goals of um, component of the shell um, uh, systems. And, uh, and, and the best part is that in, in most cases, you don't have to actually pay um, a dollar to be able to use it. And, um, but it comes with a price, and the price is, is, is usually the license. And um, Many people know how to deal with licenses. Many people think that they know how to deal with them, but they don't. And those are probably the most dangerous ones. And then there are people that are absolutely clueless about how um, this happened. And uh, so I believe that in, in the next uh, years, um, teaching licensing should actually be one of the priorities of um, software engineering programs across the world. Because now it's actually one of those, of those um, um, aspects of knowledge that everybody, everybody has to have at least some foundation to be able to understand what are the implications of building uh, software. Um, so the, the, the typical use cases, um, I think I divided in, in three. Um, so is my system honoring the licenses of all its components? And uh, almost nobody today builds a software system from scratch. Um, perhaps the kernels are some of the few ones that they do, but even they actually require um, um, uh, C libraries, for example. And, um, or given my intentions, for example, embedded systems, can I actually use this component while I honor the license requirement? And another one that is becoming uh, very interesting too is if I copy the code, which we in the research community call cloning, if I clone parts of a system or entire system, um, Maybe, maybe I will not help my, my, uh, my customer, but when the customer receives that code, it's very important for them to know whether this code has been cloned and whether actually the restrictions of the original software has been followed or whether the copyright headers have been replaced by new ones or just simply removed. And this we're seeing actually as a, as a, as a, as a more and more important problem. So um, 
software is complex. This is actually, uh, this little blue dot here is actually OpenOffice, and this is a dependency graph built from Debian uh, dependencies and uh, in the spec files. And uh, so of course there are, op uh, there are optional dependencies that actually start to actually branch, but it, this gives you uh, an idea. And these graphs are getting worse and worse as time passes by. Which from, a po from the engineering point of view is actually great. Because that means that every single one of these dots is actually doing a very specific job. It's well encapsulated, it can be tested, it can be maintained. But from the overall point of view, it becomes very complex to determine whether all the IP restrictions are being properly followed by, um, by uh, OpenOffice in this case. So um, the, the, the one, of the, one of the areas we have been looking at is, is the issue of auditing I, uh, intellectual property. And we have focused primarily on copyright. And um, we haven't touched anything else. Uh, patents is a big issue. There's also trademarks, as you well know. Um, um, Debian has, uh, was, has, has, has been um, affected by, by some of them. And um, so essentially, if I have a system, say Debian, or I have actually an embedded uh, system, am I honoring the, 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 the license of all the components that I'm using? And the first problem that people actually face is what components am I using? <coughs> and, um, and once I actually know the components, I need to actually know the license of the components. But how do I know the license of the component? Well, I have to actually look at the license of the files. But once I start to go all the way down to the, to the license of the files, then I actually have to go start going up. And if I, uh, we find that, well, the, the problem is that files interact in many different ways. And the way that they interact will actually put constraints on, um, on, on, the, on the component. And the way that the components interact actually puts constraints on whatever is built on top of them. So there are a lot of uh, small issues at, at, at play that have to be actually uh, understood. Um, so uh, what components am I using? Well, the trivial source of this data, and this was actually research that we started doing around four years ago, was to actually just look at spec files and then actually see how they start to propagate. And as I mentioned before, it gets a little bit complex by the fact that there are um, optional dependencies. And, um, and of course, um, those dependencies are fulfilled in, in many different ways, although usually with the most uh, commonly uh, uh, used software. So for example, the base Debian system actually may, means that many of those uh, optional dependencies will be satisfied by whatever is actually in the system. Um, but the main problem is that this data is really intended for a different use, which is to be able to actually run this application, what else do I need? So it might actually contain more information that is needed. And that's actually not bad uh, from the point of view of, of, of package maintenance. But from the point of view of, of, of IP, you really want to know exactly what's in there, and nothing more and nothing less. Um, but the other problem is that they don't really tell us anything about the type of interconnection. For example, if I use grep and I execute it via the command line, it's a very different thing than if I use read line and I actually uh, dynamically and statically link to it. So the constraints are different. And uh, so that's why the data in the specs is valuable, but it's not really uh, perfect for the kind of, 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 um, of IP clearance that, that we would like to do. <coughs> so um, the other thing is that um, when you have, uh, for example, dynamic linking, uh, what about plugins? So plugins constrain or allow um, Different, uh, different restrictions in terms of intellectual property. For example, Eclipse says, if you use the plugin architecture, you can have whatever license that you want. But if you actually start to use um, any other parts of, of Eclipse as a, as, as, uh, and call them, then you become a derivative work. So that also becomes uh, very, um, very um, uh, valuable. So, but in binaries, you can actually, in, in binaries and libraries, you can actually use the command lines, uh, uh, commands to actually extract um, what are the libraries they depend upon. So at least that's visible. You can actually inspect the dynamic linking tables to actually see which functions are being executed. And, uh, but that's not always possible with every kind of system. And then, ultimately, you have the build data. So you can actually look at, at, at CMake and AutoMake data uh, files and, and then try to actually see what are the, the, the specific um, um,
components that they're being used. And I'm using the word component rather than package because I'm actually, uh, I, I, will, I, will, I will talk a little bit more about the distinction between binary source and component. And, uh, and then of course, the idea that you, ha you might have to parse source code. And you might actually need to know what the source code is actually doing with each one of these uh, components that you have. And ultimately, the, the maintainers and the, pack of, of, uh, sorry, and the packagers and, uh, are the ones who, are, who, who really know what's going on. And um, so they are the ones, the maintainers particularly, they are the ones who might actually understand very well how the system is built. But all, all they know is one level of dependencies. They don't know 10 levels down. What they know is what they are using directly. And what happens sometimes is that the component that is being used, it doesn't even know that it's being used and how it's used by its, uh, by its uh, applications that exploit it. Uh, for example, our library, we don't really know exactly how it's being used. We just know some of the functions that they are being exploited. So, um, knowing the license of the component is not trivia, and I'll actually come back into this, but um, what is important is that um, at this level is that I, before I can actually argue about the license of the component, I need to argue about the license of each one of the files. So, um, let me actually uh, define some nomenclature so, so we can, uh, you, can, you can follow me and, uh, and, and I don't confuse you because it might be a little bit different from what you're used to. And uh, so I perceive this, the source file as the, as the smallest licensable unit, okay? And you can call it documentation, whatever is in the source, in the source code, any file that is there that is actually used to create the, the, the derivative work, um, sorry, the, 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 the installable object. And uh, if it's broken down, for example, somebody comes and extracts a function and puts somewhere else, that's a derivative work. And therefore, it has there are some restrictions that apply um, that that I don't need to really fall into that. Now, licenses are, I define them as a simple license. Like, I tell you, this is GPL version two, or this is GPL version two, uh, or any after, or this is GPL version two with Bison exception. Very well defined, very well known license. And then, a license can also be a disjunction of licenses, like Perl that says that we can have a, a artistic license version one, or you can choose a GPL version one, or any, any, any after. Or it can be a conjunction of licenses, which means all the licenses apply. And if I define it recursively, that means that I can actually have conjunction followed by a disjunction, followed by another license. And we have actually seen things like that, okay? And then the source files create installable objects, that they are the ones that actually do something. The source code doesn't. But in some times, they are identical, like for example, scripting languages in which um, the Perl source code will actually be the same as the installed one in many cases. Or they have to be uh, compiled. So um, source packages are composed of source files and binary packages are composed of installable, install, installable objects and, uh, and, and components. The license statement is the comments at the beginning of a file, well, typically at the beginning of a file, that contain the license of uh, the licensing uh, of, of, of the file. And, and, and uh, they're categorized into two ones, by inclusion, like for example, MIT, that you have to put a statement of the MIT license into the, into the, into the file, um, or by reference, in which you, you actually say, this file is licensed under the following, and you can find a copy of the license here or there. Uh, the GPL, for example, the Apache version two, um, the Eclipse uh, public license. Uh, they basically say, this is the, the, this is the license of the file and you can find it somewhere else. Or in many cases we see C file copying in root directory, okay? Which makes it a little bit more complex. So what is the license of a file? Of a file? Well, it's not always trivial because there are too many licenses. And um, so you go to OSI and OSI says, well, there are around 65 licenses in use, plus the ones that have been um, 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 removed or, or, or replaced by newer versions. And, um, but the reality is that there are many, many others that they are being used in systems. And, uh, and many of those ones, we don't even know uh, which ones they are. And uh, because if we haven't seen them, we don't know they exist, okay? The other problem is that uh, many developers modify licenses. Um, the GPL, for example, has the exception, um, has the ability to add exceptions to it. 
from my point of view, if, uh, if, a file, if, if a file has a GPL with an exception, that's a different license. It's not the GPL anymore. It's, it's one of the children of that version of the GPL. But from a practical point of view, it acts as a different license because it cannot be combined the same way as with software without that exception. So, uh, sometimes they actually fix grammar. They, they modify the spelling. So uh, the, the British against the American spelling happens. So sometimes they actually make spelling mistakes uh, uh, um, without intention. This is a major problem. How many licenses are there in a file? When do I stop? And uh, so it's one, two, three, four, five. We have found, I think that the worst one we have seen is nine licenses and uh, in just one single one. And once we know the licenses are there within a file, how do they interact? Do they say this or this or this and this, but not this one? Or we have seen it sometimes that says this file is not licensed under the GPL. Okay. Um, let me give you some examples, and um, maybe I should just maximize a little bit here to actually make it more readable. Redistribution. Sometimes they optionally put the S at the end. Sometimes they add a comma. Or sometimes they add without modification. Quotes, what is a quote? Well, it can be this, or it can be this, or it can be this. Merchantability or merchantability. Some people write it in different ways. Uh, some people put the hyphen in non-infringement. Okay? So that gives you an idea in terms of actually that uh, just, just um, Determining the license of, of, of a file by just doing texture analysis is actually difficult. Many of the tools before Fosology uh, was released, what they will do is just simple regular expressions on terms like GPL. If I see GPL, it's a GPL license file. Well, we have found that if the file says this is not in the GPL, it does actually say um, the contrary. Um, this is a much more complex example, and this actually comes from a Java file and uh, from Sun. Basically, this file says that it's actually under the CCDL and the GPL, and you can choose one of the others, and he actually specifies the conditions in which you can add one of the other, and you can actually remove one of the licenses from the other. So it makes me actually wonder, and I'm not a lawyer, and I should have said that from the beginning, whether, for example, this close down here makes this the GPL plus CCDL a different kind of ver a license than saying one or the other, which is basically C GPL plus CCDL with very specific conditions. On top of that, we have that there's an Apache license down here, Apache version here. And some of the purists from the Free Software Foundation will say that cannot happen because it's incompatible with the GPL version two. But that's what is there, okay? So we cannot, we, we don't really make an, a, a, a case for whether it's, it's right or wrong. All we say is that's what I'm seeing, okay? Like one of my colleagues says, we're more like the police, we're just looking for inconsistencies. And then we let the judge actually decide uh, what's going on. So um, these are actually some of the, some of the issues more summarized that we have found. Um, the, the challenge of finding the license, um, they're mixed with text. And uh, so which text is actually relevant to the licensing statement and which one is not. Um, files might reference another file where the license is, is, is located. And it's not very standard how this is done. For example, we, uh, the one that, that I hate the most is um, the license is in the file such, which is in the root directory. And, uh, and as the code actually moves around, you find that there are several of those files in different root directories. And um, Language related and uh, spelling errors, um, different ways to actually refer to, to, a, to a license. And, uh, and as I mentioned before, spelling grammar. Um, customization. MIT and BSD have to be customized before they can be used. And uh, licensors modify, add or remove conditions to well-known licenses. And, um, and or they modify them for different intents. So we developed a, um, a tool, and um, we, we, we started using Fosology, and it was not 
it was not good enough for some of the analysis that we wanted to do. So we develop another uh, license identification tool, and uh, and this should uh, should actually be out as as GPL version three plus um, in few days. And uh, the tool is lightweight. It's a bunch of, of of scripts with a lot of regular expressions. There's a paper in my website that actually describes the methods used to it. And one thing that we did was actually trying to evaluate um, how good it was. Can you explain very briefly what phosology is? I, I, okay. I'm not familiar with that. So uh, phosology, and tomorrow there will be a talk, is, is an integrated environment to actually do a lot of this licensing analysis. And one of the most important parts of phosology is being developed by HP is um, license identification, which basically you give it a file and it tells you uh, with some probability which is the license that it, um, that it contains, or the licenses. And um, <coughs> The problem is that Phosology was making mistakes, and it was actually not capable of, the f of, 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 of saying, I don't know which license this is. And, uh, and those were actually things that we really wanted to do. We wanted to say, when I tell you the license, I want to be accurate, I want to be precise, and I don't want to be mis make mistakes. But at the cost that, at, for many files, I will say, I don't know which one it is. With the, with the, with the idea that, you can then concentrate your efforts in those ones that they are actually different. Um, so in, in our uh, small experiment that we run, so we actually found that uh, we had seven incorrect licenses because most of the time what we did is that we did not identify every single licensing detail into the file. So we'll say there's a GPL version two, but we missed an exception, for example. And um, on the other hand, we have tools that they're actually widely used like OCount and OSLC that actually um, are very, they have very low uh, precision because they don't tell you the precise version that they actually detect. And when you do um, license analysis um, and, and IP clearance, you really need to know the, 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 the version because it's not the same to have GPL version two that to have GPL version three. And it's not the same to have GPL version two plus. So that's actually what's very important. So um, with that, then we started actually running some analysis. And, uh, and, and I should clarify that the, the statistically speaking, there's a difference of around three, four percent. So all of these are really statistical ties, okay? And um, in Debian 5.20, so uh, this is what we found of, um, of the files that we could identify a license. We're capable of saying, no, this file doesn't have a license. And that's something that was actually very blurry with the other tools that we wanted to be able to do. Um, as you can see, no license is actually the most common one and uh, in, in around 31% of, of the files. And, uh, and then the GPL version two. One thing that I found very interesting is this license doesn't exist. The lesser GPL version two. It should be library GPL version two. But GNOME has some files that started with that, and guess what? People start cut and paste license headers without thinking about them. So this has been propagated, okay? Whether that's a problem, uh, most people don't think so, but actually it tells you a little bit of, of, of the challenges. <coughs> Notice, for example, uh, that license that I was showing you, the CCDL or GPL version two. It's in 37,000 files, but it's only in two applications. And uh, so there's a big imbalance in that respect. So um, this is because essentially Sun is the only one who uses it. And Sun uses uh, um, use it for GlassFish. GlassFish is actually really a lot of cloning of other applications, um, particularly from Apache, okay? And they have actually replaced some of those headers, and some of those headers actually uh, are, are, are incorrectly uh, um, replaced, but that's a different story that I so by application, um, this can actually tell you, so um, GPL version two is still in the lead, but now you see the C file. And um, these are, license appears at least once on each one of those applications, okay? The one I really like is the same as Perl. And I think, uh, so uh, same as Perl basically says, the license of this, of this file is the same as Perl an indirect uh, relationship. There are several reasons why I like it. One of them is that it's actually very practical. The day that Perl moves to the next version, all the modules will move with it. No need to modify them. And the other thing is that uh, with Perl, 
when you actually create the, 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 the template for a new module, it actually creates the license statement for that. And most people don't change it. So that actually part of the reason that uh, that is, is there and it's so common. <coughs> Doesn't that create a lot of ambiguity, though? About, I mean, if the sh version of the license that Perl uses changes from Perl five to six or something, would, would and, and that same module is used in both cases, I mean, doesn't that? Cr I mean, you're, it's unclear what the licensing is. For but that remember, module. the beauty of this is that all you have to say is grab a. Uh, so when you get confronted by the problem, all you have to say is grab a version of Perl that has the license that you're looking for. And say, and, and if your module runs with that, then it satisfies the condition. Okay, so it's very pragmatic. Okay, and it basically defers the analysis to the very last stage, which is deployment. Okay, but I agree with you; it actually adds new complexity. But that's actually the beauty. Uh, the, the beauty of it is that it's very, very uh, uh, adaptive. <coughs> so. We couldn't really argue anything about those systems that have many licenses because we don't know how the files interact. So we said, let's look at those files in which every single file is resolved. Either it does not have a license or it's a very specific license and all the files have that. So we found that there are actually um, a few number of them and, uh, and many, many of them actually come with GPL version two. You can actually see same as Perl two. And um, so this, basically give us um, a, 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 a base ground um, to say these ones we can, actu we can actually argue about it, how they are created, etc. But they're relatively few compared to the number of systems that exist. <laughs> so that's, that's with respect to, 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 the, to the source code. Now what about the installable object um, and the packages? And uh, so I said before, so if they all have the same license, then it's trivial, okay? Although we have seen that Maybe, may, maybe all the files are GPL version 2 plus, but the package, the maintainer decides that it's GPL version 3, and that's valid, okay? So it's, 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 it's not as simple as, 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 as it could be, but it's not difficult to actually say y y whether yes or no, that's actually valid. The problem is when, for example, the, so the source package is split into different binary objects, and each one of them has a different license. We see that a lot with, with uh, libraries, that the, the, that the executables are under the GPL and the libraries are under LGPL. Um, sometimes the licenses are in the documentation and uh, so you really have to actually read the documentation to understand the constraints that exist. And the worst part is when there are errors in the license and uh, many cases by the developers and many cases by the packagers. So we have to look at Fedora because, um, well, Debian hasn't really taken the job of trying to determine the license of, of, of a package, and, uh, and Fedora does, because that's part of their business model. And uh, for every binary package, they state its license, and we call that its declare license. So we'll say, this is what you can install, and this is the license that comes with that. And, um, and, and they do this, this job, they, they, they try to actually uh, look at the source code, they try to actually uh, understand in the intention of the creator, they talk to the creators to try to understand uh, what the license is. <coughs> so uh, this, is, this is, for example, packages that have all the files with the same license. And that again is the, the way that we can simply uh, do an, uh, an automatic analysis and comparison. So notice actually some things that they are very peculiar. One of them is BSD. BSD for uh, Fedora is any BSD, which creates problems when you're trying to do analysis because BSD4 is not compatible with, with the GPL. So you cannot actually mix it. So it will be very valuable to have that decision, but they don't have it. There are different types of MITs, and that's actually one of the challenges we have seen. And, uh, but for them, they're just MIT. Um, and then you actually have the also the problem of, of naming. ASL 2.0, and we call it Apache version 2, okay? So it's, it's and this is actually a problem that, that has been addressed, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention that briefly later. And uh, that we need basically a uniform way to, sp to, to indicate a li the name of a license, so we can actually do um, some, some types of analysis. So 
we, we try to, uh, so, so in, in another one of, of the works we did, uh, we tried to do automatically um, audit the licensing and then compare results against the ones in Fedora and try to actually s see wh what we learned. And, um, and one thing that it was, it was clear is that um, if our tools did not identify correctly the license, we will get actually uh, false positives. So that's actually one of the biggest challenges. For example, um, this one, we actually didn't identify that there's an exception. So we actually saw that, yes, it was GPL version 2, but we did not identify the exception. And therefore, we were not actually, um, um, we couldn't actually um, do it properly. <coughs> so um, this, for example, is patches with one license that is inconsistent with the declared license. And uh, so this is, uh, this is an interesting example. The source code, all of it is EPL version 1, very nicely formatted. But the declared license is EPL and CPL. Notice that there is lack of version. There is actually version 0 0.5 that is not supposed to be used, but we still find it once in a while, and the CPL. And uh, what happened is that the documentation actually said CPL somewhere. And because they used probably just uh, grip, they actually found it and they said, oh, this has the CPL. Okay. And um, this is another major problem that we have. We, we, we came across by accident. It's actually very pervasive and it's, it's, it's one of those big challenges today. As software changes licenses, it puts pressure above, below, and sideways. And then people have to actually migrate. And uh, so we found is that Fedora probably did the analysis sometime before, and then it was Apache software license version 1.1, and then it moved to Apache version 2, but they didn't actually update it. And uh, so that was actually very common. Another one is we found this VSL, and we couldn't actually find the license anywhere. We just don't know what actually that license was. Um, then we saw, well, let's look at BSD4 and see what happens actually, is, B, is, is BSD4 used within GPL? Well, it happens that yes it is, but when the copyright owner is the University of California or NetBSD, they have issued another letter that is somewhere else that says, it's okay, it, act, it acts actually as a BSD3. You can essentially drop the statement, but they don't tell you that you can actually remove it from the license. They basically say that it act acts like the other one. So you have this file still moving with a BSD4 that if you attach this extra letter, becomes a BSD3, okay? And um, sample code, this was actually, in, in, in examples we actually saw this, and uh, the, 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 the file didn't really have any, any um, importance in the, in, the, in the creation of Bash, but it was just one script that was actually doing an example, and it was under the BSD4. <coughs> and then we found actually some suspicious files that, uh, that had it, and, um, but um, we don't really know exactly what, 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 hap what was going on with them. We reported a lot of this to Fedora. Fedora was great. Fedora was actually very happy that we, that we started doing this. They helped us in, in, in many ways, and we, we uh, submitted our, 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 uh, the problems that we detected to them. Many of them, they have been fixed. All of all other ones, they have been looking at them. Many of them were actually sent upstream. In some cases, the problem had been fixed, and, uh, but they just hadn't propagated uh, to Fedora yet. License evolution, you can see it here, that the clear license is an older version than the current version. And uh, so it, was, it happened over and over and over again. <coughs> so what we have learned is, um, so there, there are applications that have errors in their licensing, and um, in many cases, Files don't have a license that they should have it. And, um, or the, the licensing information is somewhere else. For example, Linus Torvalds has a clarification that says, if a file doesn't have a license, it's GPL version 2. Plus or version 2? I don't remember. And, but it, he has the clarification saying, if lack of license, this is the license that applies. Um, this, we have seen it many times, uh, for example, um, in Sofish, which is the window manager that I run, um, some files have GPL version 3, but um, 3 plus, and Sofish is GPL version 2 plus. So I emailed the maintainer, and, and I contribute, and he said, um, uh, so I asked him, so are we planning to move into version 3, but you haven't told us? I said, no, it was a mistake, I cut and paste the wrong header. 
and then and he promptly fixed it. Uh, inconsistent lo license clauses, this is actually more dangerous because we don't, we're not really the lawyers, we under, don't understand that. And the example that I show you with uh, Apache version two against uh, uh, GPL as, 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 <coughs> as, as, a, as, as a conjunction, um, may actually be one of these things that makes them um, in, inconsistent. Um, the incorrect name of the license, um, as I mentioned, um, the lesser GPL version one, uh, version two, that doesn't exist, but the intention is probably that it was a uh, library GPL version two. And then the other problem is that once you detect that there is a bug in the license, then it can only be edited by the copyright owners unless they have actually gave you a spe specific permission via the license to be able to actually do it. And um, many of you might be familiar with cases in which a uh, system wants to upgrade from one license to another, and they start contacting developers and, uh, and sending almost these uh, bottles in the ocean saying, do you know this guy who used to work in this place 10 years ago and, and go by this email and this name because we need to contact him so he can actually give us um, the right to change his license. I really want to hear license stories. If you have any of them, I'll be very, very happy to actually uh, to, to listen to them. And um, that's actually one of the things that we we'll actually collect. Um, um, how um, defects in licenses uh, exist, what are they, and they, how they affect everything else. Um, we have actually quotes by important people in, 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 our, in our environment that basically says that uh, licensing errors are, are, are very, very unique and very difficult because they cannot be addressed by, by everybody. You have a specific people who understand what is going on, that they are the only ones who can actually address them. And in many cases, if they were the copyright owner, they might not even be able to solve it, which is very different to, from the rest of the source code. <coughs> so what we need in terms of license maintenance, we need tools to edit license statements. And as simple as that sounds, uh, the best that we have in the industry is the scripts that run and replace. Uh, Apache and, and Mozilla, they try to mark the, the headers. So you know from, from where it starts to where it ends. So they can do some regular uh, expression matching and replace that if they want. But those are really cumbersome. What we really need is a way to actually tell Emacs, look, the files in this directory are under the GPL. So make sure that I all the time actually update it. And when the address of, of the Free Software Foundation changes, go and modify it if I'm the corporate owner. But for these other files, I, I'm not the owner, so let, leave them like, as they are, okay? Um, verify the validity of, of the license statements, and, and that's actually part of, of, of Ninka, that it's actually moving in that direction, part of Fosology, that we can actually run tools that tell us the license is this or is that. Um, we need unification of licenses, and by unification, I don't mean actually uh, the idea of, 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 of removing, um, avoiding the license proliferation problem, but rather actually saying, all these licenses are really the same license. They're just different wordings of the license. And that's actually work that cannot be done by us. It has to be done by, by the lawyers. <coughs> uh, summarizing licenses in source code files, and that's actually uh, work that Kate Stewart is actually doing with, with some people from, um, um, from industry. And uh, so there's a standard towards an XML specification to actually uh, document the licensing of files within a source code file. And it's called SPDX, and, uh, and Kate will actually talk next week in, in, in the Linux Conf about it. And when is th what is the goal uh, that it will be by the end of this year that there will be the spec, right? Okay. So, but that's actually towards that, that we will actually have a way to, to precisely document it. And a way to track copyright owners. And, um, and I know the issues of privacy are big, but. Um, we need to know who the copyright owner of a file is. And copyright ownership is so badly described in source code. Um, for example, say, um, um, a lot of code from Eclipse says, the copyright owner is IBM plus the contributors listed below. And, um, and then you go into, into a huge list of, of contributors. It's not actually clear what they contribute, what kind of claim they have on the files. In many other cases, uh, people just actually remove them uh, over time because uh, they say, oh, the copyright, is the copyright is here, but this is actually just extra information. Let's actually remove it. That information is very easy to get lost. <coughs> so how can uh, Debian maintainers help? So I think that uh, Debian, uh, the advantage has the credibility and the way to be listened to. 
and it's, it's a lot of hard work, but somebody has to do it. And, uh, and David maintainers, well, they're actually not the ones that will run away from, from a good fight. These are uh, some suggestions. And uh, one of them, and perhaps one of the most important ones, is to incorporate licensing into the process. I know that you have a copyright file, but if you look at the way that copyright files are created now, they're all, all flavors. Some people just cut and paste every single license that they found in every single file, and they put in the copyright file. Some people actually clearly say, this uh, system is under such license, et cetera. So it needs to be actually more, more, um, more documented as part of the process. For example, um, you have the patch tagging guidelines. Uh, why not to actually add license uh, to a patch? So you, you, it's clear actually what is the license that is being submitted with that patch. Um, verify the licenses on the source code, and you do that, and, 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 and you have been great. You have done a lot of work in that direction, and, uh, but it uh, needs to be done a little bit more. Um, for example, force them to use canonical forms. And uh, if, a, if, if a license says, uh, this file is under GPL, um, force them to actually do the wording that the Free Software Foundation does. And, um, because that actually helps everybody. And it's not a matter of saying you have to do that, but actually explain the benefits that everybody actually gains by doing that. Um, if ambiguous, if a license is ambiguous, then get clarification from upstream and actually make it part of, of the license statement of the files. And there will be many cases that cannot be resolved. Then document that. Because if you go through that, it's, it's likely that some of the people will actually have to uh, go through that again. And there's no point on duplication of effort. And that's part of the SPDX um, effort to try to avoid that. Document how the binaries are created. I know that this is actually difficult. And, uh, but which source code actually creates a binary? It's very important to actually be able to know that. And, uh, and how the source code actually interacts. And flag the files that are not used in the creation of binaries. Like saying, these files, they're part of the distribution source code, but they don't really impact the deliverable, which is the installable uh, binary. Break binary packages so each component has the same effective license. Because we often see that actually uh, packages that have many different licenses. I know that there are some packages like Image Magic is one of the worst. Okay? Each file is actually listed with its own license. And they are of many, many different flavors. Um, but there are cases in which you have a GPL version 2 with MIT. And you can say, well, this basically effectively works as a GPL version 2. And everything that you find in here will effectively work as a GPL version 2. And, uh, but if we have some files, that uh, binaries, that they are GPL version 2, and sometimes they are GPL version 2 plus, that creates a problem for the people of, uh, that they are using this dependency. Because if it's GPL version 2, Version 3, they will be able to use it, but GPL version 2, they will not be able to use it. Or they maybe they will be able to, uh, let me just finish this, and, 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 and uh, or they, uh, they will be able to use it for a while, but they will not be able to actually upgrade. I'm actually almost done, okay? And, uh, and document the types of, of dependencies. Um, it's, is this a library, uh, in, in, in the spec files, is this a library, a plugin, an executable, configuration installation? So uh, you, we can actually do a little bit more analysis uh, from that data, okay? <coughs> just, just to end, and uh, so if, if you have interesting license stories, then, then let me know. And if you have actually interesting license problems that you think that we can actually help, then let me know. I'm actually very interested about it. Okay? Yeah. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Um, so I've got a few questions about this page in particular. First of all, where you've got MIT and GPLv2 and GPLv2 and GPLv2 plus. I don't see any difference between those because both of those you can use under the GPLv2 and nothing else. Uh, in the case of GPLv2 <coughs> and GPLv2 plus, you can treat everything as GPLv2 in that case, which is the same as the previous case, surely. That's right. But let's say that you have two components within that binary package. One component is GPL version 2 and another component is GPL version 2 plus. You want to use the GPL version 2 plus only, OK? Now, I'm an I'm, 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 I'm application, and I'm, using, and I'm seeing that as a library, and my version is GPL version 2. Fine, perfectly, everything works. But tomorrow, I want to migrate to version 3. I cannot do it, at least not in the way that it's being packaged. Uh, if 
you, I, I don't think copyright follows package dependencies. I think if you have a single package that contains two libraries, one of which happens to be two plus, one of which happens to be two, and you're linked against the two plus, there's no problem with that. Uh, I understand it makes um, uh, life difficult for people like you who are trying to analyze these um, interactions and dependencies. But that's not the primary reason we. Uh, no, I, I understand that, and and you you need to actually see it from the point of view of the people using the packages, okay? Sure. So we 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 are intermediaries. We're just messengers. The real problem is for the people who are actually doing um, at their analysis and saying, well, this actually looks like we cannot migrate to the next version of the GPL, and then they have to look more carefully into why. And if they were just split, they would say, oh, that's not a problem. We can actually migrate automatically. Okay, so that's that's mainly the, the the rationale that then you can do automatic analysis of this. Um, last couple of points. First of all, um, have you noticed that there's currently a proposal for a machine readable copyright format uh, for Debian copyright files? Um, so whilst at the moment yes, everything's freeform, there is actually a proposal for making them standardised with 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 fields and stuff. So I don't know how that interacts with your. Cool. Um, and the last thing was with copyright contributors, um, I know certainly a lot of, uh, of, of upstream projects as well, uh, not just when we're summarizing things, um, will, when you've got, you know, patches from hundreds of different people to different parts of different files, it's not, it's not particularly feasible to be able to track these lines here were contributed by this person, because actually these lines here might be contributed by several people and so on, and what they'll tend to do if they do it at all, will keep a top level file and say, look, you know, these people have contributed to this, but you know, it's not feasible to track all of the individuals. And I think that version control is the solution there. And uh, that in version control you basically say, um, and I don't think that any of the version control systems actually include the license as part of them. But I think that it's an attribute of the of, of, of the delta, right? Who actually made it and whether that's the copyright owner. And I think that um, the way that the, that the Linux kernel is is, is doing that, uh, it's in that direction, okay? And uh, but I agree with you. It's actually very difficult. Now, what we have to remember is that the metadata in Debian is very useful for Debian, but I think it has to be pushed to the applications upstream, because uh, then everybody can actually uh, benefit from that. So um, on Monday, Bradley was talking about a, a solution for, in, in this case of documentation, to be able to be used in a broader context that it would be destructively licensed CC by SA and GPL. And I'm wondering if in your analysis you've, you've come across destructive licensing or if you might have best practices for how to do that. So, you, you so basically future analysis can grok that properly. Um, I think that in terms of disjunctive licenses, what I think is the best practice this to this day is when an organization says, this is our license, which is a disjunctive license, which basically lifts us into this model that I, I call recursive. Because they, they clarify exactly how each one of them works. And Mozilla, for example, has done it very well. And they say how each one of the licenses interact with each other and which conditions you can use one and not the other. And that. Uh, but the way, the way I think it has to be solved is by saying, we're no longer dealing with three ors or two ors, but rather with a license that is subdivided into the following. Yeah, just even another uh, thing to think about here as well is the fact that you have to be cognizant of whether or not you're forming a derivative work is necessarily jurisdiction dependent. Um, so it depends upon which copyright regime you're operating under. Uh, and, and that's something that, that complicates this. And it, it cuts in different ways depending, and the different ways it cuts changes depending upon court decisions. So not only does it depend on the regime, it depends on the current legal outlook, your current risk assessment, uh, and also it, there's also underlying this the question of copyrightability. Uh, I mean, whether the work actually forms a work that is capable of being copyrighted. And so all these things make any type of automated license analysis for the purpose of demonstrating whether it's okay or not okay to use a work very fraught. I mean, you have to, at, at the end of the day, if you wanna totally manage your risk, you, you have to do it manually. Or, I mean, use tools like this as a starting point, but at the end of the day, you have so to go so in. So at the end, you said exactly the, the, the answer. So. Um, 
what we really want, and, I, and when I say we, I don't mean actually I, re researcher, because I re really don't care, right, ultimately, because I do right, research and tell whether they're bad things or good things. We as a community, what we need is tools that allow us to concentrate our efforts where the efforts need to be. So we can say, those packages, they have just one license. And we don't really have to worry because they are all nice and, and everything is nicely packaged. But these are the packages, they have such an interaction of licenses that they become a line, line my, uh, uh, mine line, uh, field. And, and we have to be very careful how that is used. And that includes actually uh, issues of, 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 of um, uh, location around the world and how they, uh, as, as, as yesterday, uh, um, Ken was talking about that, how actually uh, the legal uh, framework changes with time. So we, we can actually be aware that those are the areas where we have to concentrate. Uh, I can see why this stuff doesn't get challenged very frequently. <laughs> and maybe, I'm just, I, I don't know the answer, but should we also track either the entity who owns the copyright actually is a legal entity in terms of, let's say, person is okay, right? He, he exists. Debian even project because it doesn't own the copyright right now. Any team, right? What is the legal entity should we kind of go for? Because many teams, instead of going for the a long list of m contributors, they just go for some meta name, right? And they go after it. Is that okay? Should they be somehow clarified? What's but uh, that, that's a good question. So uh, one of the problems with, for example, the, the way that IBM does its, its copyrights is that they actually say the copyright is IBM and they put as a contributor their employees, which are actually not the owners of the copyright because it's actually IBM itself. So we have extra information. So to be precise and give you an answer, I don't know. And I'm not actually the person who's capable of answering that. I just think that we need to worry more about where the source code comes from. So will you be able to actually go and ask them later in the future when something goes wrong? Just a question along that line, and I, I guess to, to Don's point also, I mean, if I submit a patch or something, I don't want to be connected to it at all. <laughs> and I'm just wondering if there's any, you know what I mean? I don't want anyone to follow up. I want some way to just give it away completely. We, we no have one the needs public to domain for that. Right, so, so uh, do you see dangers there? Say it again. The copyright owner is allowed to actually say this is put into, into the public domain, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So in a number of jurisdictions, it, it, it is very hard to put things in the public domain. Specifically in this jurisdiction, uh, the only way it can get into the public domain is if you die and then wait 75 years, or if it's funded by the federal government, uh, that uh, you cannot say this is in the public domain. Well, uh, so and so in some other jurisdictions, there is no concept of the public domain, so it's never a safe thing to do. So, so let me actually put it from a pragmatic point of view. What we need is to document it. To say this, we don't know where it comes from. It's better than to actually say, of all the patches, I need to actually go through each one of them and see which ones are the ones I know and which ones I don't know. I, I guess the issue there seems now you're locking up. Now, now no one knows what to do with that component. I guess I'm, I'm looking for a, a way somehow that we can just, I, I don't know. I, I know what you're saying. Legally, we can't put things in the public domain, but just, just get them out. <laughs> Can't you just assign copyright to the whoever you're giving the patch to? That's that's the other solution that? many have used, right? So assigning copyrights to somebody else. I mean, wh whoever. Uh, yeah, but, but again, I mean, if it, if I mean, you, you're going to have to declare something, right? But but notice that there is the difference between I the between the right. philosophical <laughs> the philosophical issues and the pragmatic issues, right? And I think that we have to actually find a place in the middle. And uh, basically, what I'm saying is that this information has not been properly documented up to date. And uh, I think that that's that's the next step that we need to actually move forward. And whether this is the solution or not, that's just basically a proposal. I think that ultimately what we want is the information to be available, so the people who care they can actually find it, and we don't have this duplication of efforts everywhere. So I'm, I'm happy to see your proposal for ways to improve, and it, it would be good, it definitely would be good to have some sort of, you know, um, put pub make public some sort of concrete proposals for package maintainers to be able to follow. So, and specifically, I'm curious, do you, um, 
do you recommend things like just trying to convince um, upstream and package maintainers to just use boilerplate licenses that exist that referenced as files on the system or should should all files include the full license and the header the full license statement should be in every single one of the source code files because source code files are copied and moved around so the full GPLv3 copy and paste no, no, in but the, front. The, 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 li the license statement, which is the reference to the license, that will say this file is on right, the, the GPLv3. Right, but then you're referencing something else that, that is in but an unclear everybody location. knows how that is done. So what I'm saying is that the canonical ways in which licenses are referenced, Eclipse publishes the, the, the manner, Apache publishes the manner, Mozilla does it, the, G the Free Software Foundation does it. So all that there has to be done is to say, you say that this file is in the GPL, but it's not the canonical form, so please do it in the canonical form. This will go a long way on, on helping this analysis. Yeah, I, I agree, but because actually, at least for the GPL, the license reference is very clear. It says, as published by the Free Software Foundation, blah, 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 blah. So there's no ambiguity at all, I think. That's right, yes. And th we, say we find files that say, this file is on the GPL. Yes. Any more questions? Um, oh, yeah, Don. That's okay. We have, yeah, the, let's, we won't, we're not missing too much of one. Uh, just one more additional question. Has there been, or are you aware of research where people are actually looking at ignoring the license statements and files, the actual physical lines of code and their origin? Um, to connect them between projects, to, to look for the type of cop. I mean, this is an unfortunate, uh, just a question of, I mean, derivation. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm working with people in Korea now doing origin analysis of Java. Java is horrendous because there's no real package management at the installation phase. So what we are finding is that there's a lot of people that they cut and pay, oh the sorry, that they clone entire subsystems and include them as part of the source code. Just look at, gla at Glassfish, as I mentioned. And, uh, and in many cases, they actually have these tools that go and blandly replace copyrights on every file. So you actually find a lot of source code files that have actually the wrong copyright owners when you actually look at, at the entire history. And uh, so I'll, uh, I'm convincing a lot of my colleagues in a field called clone detection that this is really where, 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 where the problems are. And I think that that's actually going to happen in the next two or three years. A lot of people actually looking into this. Uh, I call it massive clone detection. What I really want to see, and, uh, and we were working in some algorithms actually for doing that, is server, servers that you can basically say, tell me anything you know about this file. And it will actually come back and say, well, that file is actually uh, uh, present in such and such and such place. On those functions actually present in such and such place. And uh, so you are able to actually track that because I think that that's uh, the, the plagiarism is, is, is potentially a big issue with the Java people. All right, let's thank the speaker again.